the studios of KPFK Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles, this is Uprising and I'm Sonali Kohatkar. It's Friday, May 22nd, 2015. They Know Everything About You. That's the title of Robert Shear's book. The veteran award-winning journalist joins us in studio for the hour to discuss how data collecting corporations and snooping government agencies are destroying democracy. That's coming up after the news. Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Arun Gupta, sitting in for Christina Mislan. Arun is a contributor to The Guardian, In These Times, The Progressive and Truth Out. Welcome back to the show, Arun. Nice to be with you, Sonali. Months after a national scandal erupted over the Senate Intelligence Committee's report on the CIA's Bush-era torture tactics, a federal judge has ruled that the details of the report will remain secret. Of the 7,000-page report, only the 480-page executive summary has so far been released to the public, and that document was seriously damning. The judge effectively ruled that Congress has the right to keep things secret from the public, and since the Senate is now dominated by the GOP, their choice for secrecy has been declared constitutional. But it's not just the Republican presidency of Bush that has a stench of war crimes. The Pentagon admitted this week that Obama's war on Syria likely killed civilians, in particular children, and a new Amnesty International report just detailed widespread torture among both sides of the Ukrainian conflict, including the U.S.-backed Ukrainian government forces. Arun, how important is it for the public to see this CIA report in its entirety? Well, I, I think it's very important. Uh, we need to know exactly what the CIA was up to, uh, their use of torture. But the government doesn't want people to know because uh, what we already do know is uh, just a widespread widespread incompetence. They were making it up as they went along in terms of uh, the techniques and uh, tactics they were using, that torture is ineffective and, in fact, it's often counterproductive. Uh, and so the government will use a national security argument that uh, that's a reason these documents don't need to be released. But what they're really arguing is that we can't reveal our incompetence because it'll make us look bad to the rest of the world. Right. And then the Organization for Economic Cooperation Cooperation and Development, or OECD, just released a report concluding that income inequality is so high globally that it is actually damaging economic growth. The OECD, a think tank based in Paris, specifically found that two-fifths of the populations of rich nations have seen no financial gains over the past few decades. Specifically, the group said, quote, when such a large group in the population gains so little from economic growth, the social fabric frays, and trust in institutions is weakened. The U.S. is especially stark in how high inequality is between the top 10 percent and bottom 10 percent of earners. In the U.S., it's double the average among developed nations. The report entitled, In It Together, Why Less Inequality Benefits All, suggests addressing gender inequality in the workplace and raising taxes on the wealthy among its recommendations. Arun, do you get the sense that the OECD is only sort of worried about income inequality because it's actually impacting the profits of corporations, that too many people are just too poor to consume, and so that's why we should worry about it? I, I think that's a very important point. We see this type of uh, utilitarian argument all the time, uh, that uh, economic growth benefits everyone. These arguments have been made uh, for years about the Democratic Party, that actually the stock market has higher returns historically when the Democrats are in power than when the Republicans are. But what it doesn't get, though, is, of course, the political project of, of capitalism uh, and that they want to deny uh, these uh, um, resources to everyone else because if you if we did have more equality under a, a capitalist system you would find people would be fighting for more rights and for more benefits so i think this report misses the broader political and historical implications and finally the six police officers involved in the death of freddie gray in baltimore have all been indicted by a grand jury after they were charged by the state's attorney's office earlier this month while some of the initial charges were dropped in particular false arrest. The most significant ones of involuntary manslaughter and second-degree murder remained intact. The jury also added charges of reckless endanger endangerment. At the same time as this is playing out in Baltimore, the city has been racked by violent crime, while arrests are at an all-time low. Some have speculated that the Baltimore police might be intentionally engaged in a work slowdown, as the New York police did in the wake of protests and political fallout over the killing of Eric Garner. Baltimore Police Commissioner Anthony Batts denied rumors of a slowdown in 
instead blaming the public for monitoring officers too closely with cameras. Arun, what do you make of what's playing out in Baltimore right now? Is it a microcosm of the battles that we would see all over the country if police were actually made to face justice? I, I think, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, the thing is, though, we have to remember it is virtually impossible to uh, indict and convict uh, police officers in this country because under the law, they are given such impunity uh, that basically if they come before the jury and say they perceived a threat of some sort, um, they are going to walk away. And in the case of uh, Freddie Gray, you're talking about uh, uh, you'd need other officers to testify against other officers. Um, what's been, though, really important about what's going on in Baltimore is precisely revealing the extent of uh, how horrifying the situation is, such as that the city has paid out something like $5.7 million to more than 100 victims of police brutality, or we've learned recently that 2,600 people have been turned away by Baltimore jails ever after arriving there injured um, in police custody in recent years. So we're really dealing with systematic torture and violence uh, in Baltimore and across the country by police. Arun, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Arun Gupta sitting in for Christina Mislan. He is a contributor to The Guardian in these times, The Progressive and Truth Out. This is Uprising. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. When Edward Snowden revealed to the whole world that the U.S. government's National Security Agency was vacuuming up all the data it could on pretty much everyone it could, George Orwell likely rolled in his grave. The frightening dystopia of constant surveillance that Orwell had described seems to have sprung up under our very noses, and now it was laid bare. In his new book, They Know Everything About You, Robert Shear deftly weaves together the threads of corporate data mining and government spying that uses counterterrorism as justification. Shia writes, quote, the data collected by private companies is alarmingly intrusive and pervasive. Because it is based on the gullible cooperation of individuals deluded into thinking this data will not be shared with governments, the data mining by for-profit corporations provides governments everywhere with a frightening mechanism of totalitarian control, end of quote. The post-Snowden world is a terrifying one, and no doubt many of us have already curtailed our own behavior for fear of appearing subversive. And this is exactly the function of the surveillance state and the antithesis of democracy. To explore these ideas for the hour, I'm very pleased to welcome Robert Shear in studio today. He's a former national affairs correspondent and columnist for the Los Angeles Times, the editor-in-chief of the Webby award-winning online magazine truthdig.com. He's also a professor at the University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. And he's the co-host of the weekly political radio program Left, Right and Center on KCRW. KCRW the National Public Radio Affiliate in Santa Monica, California. His uh, books include The Pornography of Power and The Great American Stick-Up, and his latest book is called They Know Everything About You, How Data-Collecting Corporations and Snooping Government Agencies Are Destroying Democracy. Welcome to Uprising, Bob. I am. That's Thanks. a long introduction. <laughs> I, I didn't realize I, I'm exhausted by hearing that. You have done a lot, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and and I think this is why um, someone like yourself... You on yes, of course. Uh, you, you said uh, because of Edward Snow, it's so interesting. Uh, there's a, I, I like quoting Leonard Cohn because he's the same age as I am, and uh, so there's some wisdom in the old guys. And he said, there's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets through. And the significance of, of Edward Snowden is not that he created the problem, it's that he exposed it. Right. And that's how he the light... laid it bare. Yeah. <laughs> and laid it bare. There were others, there were other right. whistleblowers, but the great contribution of Edward Snowden is that he did what Daniel Ellsberg did. He, he released the, the key d documents. And not that they're key because they threaten anyone's life or make us weaker. That's a whole bogus argument. What is key about them, central, is that they're irrefutable. And that now we know about the prison program. We know about the alliance between the private sector, profit-making sector, and the government. And that was the thing that was not exposed. Now, we could have a lively argument with the folks from Google or Apple 
about what they knew or didn't know. Uh, but that was covered up, and that's key. Because if it can be assumed to be in the private sector and you want to give Yelp or Facebook or anybody else your location and who you had dinner, how far you read in a book, what your underwear size is, what movie you watch, who you meet with, I mean, it's exhaustive. There is no dictator in the world that could ever aspire to this kind of totalitarian knowledge. I mean, we just, you know, they do know everything. And this data is not held just by some companies you may like, but it's mined by third parties, it's swapped. Right around so it's just out there and what was important so in incredibly important why Snowden like Ellsberg and these are the two great heroes of the last you know 60 years uh, in exposing how what modern technology does not to enforce a Luddite view I love technology I edit an internet publication I've worked on computers ever since I was a graduate student you know 60 years ago 50 years ago uh, but but the fact of the matter is that the existence of this vast storage space, the ability to compare your eyeball with 20 million other people within an hour, uh, the, the kind of data mining that can be done is, is a dictator's fantasy. That, that's the reality. And let, the, let me, let me yeah. let's, let's give you the whole book, and then you can <laughs> okay. ask anything you want. I know it's your show, but let me just say, because people miss this point. Mm -hmm. The point is, if that could be assumed to be in the private sector, and if it could be assumed that consumers have knowledge, right, that they've been told your information is going to be swapped around with all these companies and so forth, then you could say, okay, that's their business. But the fact that the government could swoop in, cut into fiber optic cables under the ocean, could grab, have backdoor access, could grab all this, and not just our government, government anywhere in the world. You know, if North Korea allegedly can do it to Sony, a sophisticated electronics company, any government in the world can tap into this stuff. And our government has said to the world, this is normal, acceptable behavior. That is the treacherous thing here. Right, and they've said it, then you've justified it by saying that everybody else does it. But let, let's step back. I want to ask you to um, put into context this notion that privacy is fundamental to notions of human freedom, because we, I think, have lost sight of that. Privacy is almost seen as a luxury today. But for constitutionalists, is privacy or as a right enshrined in the U.S. Constitution? Um, you know, the kinds of things that we do in what you call the unobserved moments? This is the great contribution of our, the framers of our Constitution. An imperfect bunch, yes, white males, we know the whole, uh, you know, uh, Howard Zinn uh, rap on it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is they had two really brilliant contributions to governance. One is they learned the lesson of Rome. You can't be both a republic and an empire. If you're going to be involved in conquering other people, lying is going to be the norm. We call it classification. But basically, it's covering lies because uh, the government routinely leaks classified information of the highest nature, as they did with the movie Zero Dark Thirty, where they bring the writer and the director right into the CIA process, show them who are the people who went after bin Laden. You can know anything you want, as long as you come out with a pro-torture movie. Uh, they leaked this all the time. And working for the LA Times for 29 years, as I did, I was routinely given classified information. All journalists are. That's 95 percent of what you have in foreign policy, national security, is leaked information that you're not supposed to have. They're not supposed to be leaking it. They only go after the people who provide information that's embarrassing to the government. That's when you go after a Snowden, a Chelsea Manning. You go after Julian Assange and so forth. Uh, so th that's the reality here is that, is that uh, uh, if you're going to have an empire, you're not going to have a representative governance in a republic. That was the wisdom of George Washington, who said, you know, beware of the impostures of pretended patriots. That's why they warned about Foreign, that, that was number one. The second, and it's Chief Justice Roberts who pointed this out in his great cell phone case uh, decision of um, uh, last June, uh, was that uh, this thing of privacy, it's not privacy, it's individual sovereignty. Mm -hmm. It's that we cede power to the state 
The state does not cede power to us. The state is to be observed with suspicion, not the public. This is the basic contribution of the American Constitution. That's why we have a First Amendment. That's why we have a Fourth Amendment. That's why you have a protection against self-incrimination. That, that's why we have separation of powers. That's why we have checks and balances. So the great contribution was they wanted to know, how do you not go the way of Rome? And this even goes back to the Magna Carta, uh, the protections, you know, uh, uh, that the king was violating in the colonies. And as Chief Justice Roberts said in that decision, which I go into in great detail in the book, he said, the American Revolution started over the Fourth Amendment. It started over that principle that even the king of England could not rummage about in the hut of the poorest peasant without a specific reason. And so that's why in the cell phone case, the court held, and they unfortunately have not applied this to the NSA's clear violation of the Fourth Amendment, but in the cell phone they said if the police find a smartphone on you, they cannot break the code and use that information. That is a general warrant forbidden by the Fourth Amendment. And they established a very important principle. They said technology does not trump these protections. It, it demands a more vigorous application of the Fourth Amendment. And Robert said it very clearly. There's more data on that smartphone than was ever in anybody's house. And therefore, to have our Constitution have meaning in the modern world, that protection has to extend from your house to your cell phone and by inference to all of the data that the CIA, the NSA, and everybody has been gathering. And in, in 1961, well before there was such a thing as the uh, Internet, uh, President Dwight D. Eisenhower in his farewell address warned about the dangers of technology and government surveillance. And you cite this in your book. How important an address was this? And did he have the sort of foresight that we really need to pay attention to? Well, I'm a big Eisenhower fan. Again, none of these people are perfect, but then again, neither am I. And I suppose you are, actually. <laughs> but, uh, oh, my goodness. No, I mean, but the fact of the matter is, you know, we all know different things. But Eisenhower, who had been through war, and by the way, opposed dropping the bomb on Hiroshima mm -hmm. and Nagasaki, uh, understood exactly how vicious uh, war profiteers can be. And, and, you know, they don't care how many people get killed as long as they make a lot of money, and they need wars or, they, or you can't have it. And, and his brother, who was uh, the president, I think, of the University of Pennsylvania, but was a great educator, helped him on this uh, speech. And, and uh, as with uh, Washington's farewell address, very similar theme. Two generals turned president, warn us about the military uh, and the war profiteers. And uh, Eisenhower, in his speech, which is interesting, go back and reread it, stresses the role of intellectuals, the role of universities, how easily they're bought off. Uh, and so actually had a good, strong uh, warning in advance of, of what has happened. And I want to make a point of before we run out of time, because that some, seems to happen on these kind of shows. <laughs> but there's a point in my book that is not made clearly in anybody else's book, uh, which somehow gets dismissed. And that is that the connection between the private sector and the government oh, has yeah, we'll been get to that. Don't intimate worry, yeah. from the beginning. But people overlook InQtel. InQtel. Let me, anybody <laughs> listening to this, check it out. InQtel, in violation of law, is a d domestic American company started by the CIA using government money. The CIA is not supposed to be involved. It's forbidden from being involved in domestic American politics for good reason. The American people are not supposed to be the enemy. And they formed this company, InQtel, that has money, seed money, in over 200 Silicon Valley companies. One of them is Palantir. Uh, CIA was Palantir's only customer for three years, the first three years of its existence. Palantir, a company formed by people from PayPal, is, you know, mince billionaires now. And, and, and they, they not only have the data mining uh, contracts for all of the intelligence agencies, they have the L.A. Police Department. Uh, they have the New Orleans Police Department. So they have been given access to this vast trove of government data that they get to mine. And they're a private for profit company that was, in effect, launched by the CIA. Why that is, you know, when I was editor of Ramparts a, a lifetime ago, we made a big stir with talking about how the CIA was involved in infiltrating domestic American organizations and made the front page in the New York Times that established our magazine. I don't know why this isn't a far, far more threatening right. example of government overreach. Let, let's talk about how the advent of the Internet coming, you know, around, you know, just before the September 11th attacks a decade or
or so before, but then really peaking. I mean, there was no Facebook when the when the attacks happened. Uh, Facebook emerged after that, and this coincidence of technology with politics that enabled the NSA to take advantage of to collect all our data uh, happened in the years after 9/11, and then that technology birthed cell phones, which took it a step further. We essentially carry these mini computers in our pockets that enable us to look things up in an instant, but it's a two-way thing. As you point out in your book, we give up our locations, for example. We give up uh, something as innocuous as a location tracking app on our cell phone um, that delivers information about our very, every move to corporate entities. Um, and that information, we now know, has been shared and is being shared b with the government. But when we give that information up, we think that this is innocuous. We think that this is better going to a enable companies to market to us, to tell us what our favorite restaurants, et cetera, are. Is that a, a, a big part of the problem, in your opinion? Of course it's a big problem, because as I said before, uh, if people have full knowledge of what is being done to them, then they can make decisions. They can uh, defeat candidates they otherwise might support. They can stop using the services of companies. They can use encryption. You know, after all, even Google and Apple, in order to protect their profits internationally, they have to, now that they've been exposed, now that we see the connection between them, they're under tremendous pressure to try to protect, not their customers. You're not a customer of, of Google because, in fact, you're the mark. Uh, you know, you're not paying for your search, and you're not paying uh, for your Gmail. So that should have made you suspicious in the first place. Uh, why, why are they giving you? The, why is Google, which is one of the richest companies in the world, could just now pay their new chief financial officer a couple hundred million bucks to go there? Uh, why, why, why are they so generous giving you this free Gmail, you know, and, and free search? Well, because you're not the customer. You're the mark. Right. It's your private data that is the source of their profit because they're going to take that data, do targeted advertising, uh, sell it to third parties or sell it to advertisers. The customers are really the advertisers, uh, people advertising who are sending you those. So, oh, how remarkable. I just looked at a dress and here's a dress exactly my size. Or I just read a book and here's another book on the subject. And everybody thinks that's a wonderful service. But that's basically using your most intimate private data to market you. Now, again, if this is something you knew about and you knew the extent, you knew about third party use of this data. You knew that it was going from your medical record to your employer to everybody else. Okay, that's your decision. But when there's no transparency, but uh, then it's not your decision. But what happened here is the government acted to prevent Facebook and Google and Apple from telling you right. what was happening to your data. They threatened them. Uh, they went after them. Facebook said, no, we have to protect these people who are using our service. You're going to destroy our business model. That's what happened to Google. Google is under tremendous pressure from the European Union, from, you know, their expansion has to come internationally. And what has been exposed is the main contradiction of what are called multinational corporations. I once wrote a book back in the 70s uh, called America After Nixon, the Age of the Multinationals, and I pointed out these multinationals could be a good thing if they truly are multinational, meaning they transcend the nation state. Okay? then they have to sink or swim on their performance internationally. If they exploit workers and workers want to protest, then they have to deal with that. That's what's happened with Apple in right. China. There's pressure. What's happened with this issue is that since the only model we have, and I say this as somebody who, uh, as you know, because you appear on, on Truthdig, uh, we're struggling with a, uh, presumably for profit e effort, well, the profit is made only we can't do it because in principle we don't do it, is made by mining your private data. Right. So Google can't give this up. Okay, because then there is no profit. This right. is the whole thing. It takes thing. away the very basis yeah, of their there profit model. There is no model. other model. The reason they have destroyed broadcast uh, television, the reason that 
print, you know, these print publications, even when they still have a lot of eyeballs, like the New York Times, but you don't need them because you can say, hey, we want 24-year-olds who are this dress size and read this kind of book and have this kind of discretionary income and go for them and we'll find them everywhere. We'll find them in their Gmail account. Yeah. We'll find them on Facebook. So that's the killer app and they're not going to abandon that. What they have to be concerned about is whether they are an agent of the U.S. national security state because if they are, then why not go with the three Chinese companies that are also now among the top ten that mm -hmm. are providing exactly the kind of same kind of service? Right. Why not go with European companies that are under the rules of the European Union that actually give a greater measure of privacy And I want to ask you about Europe, but uh, we've got a lot more to talk about. And just to remind our audience, that we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll have part two of our conversation with Bob Shear about his book, They Know Everything About You. Stay tuned. to Uprising. I'm Sonali Gohatkar. Did you know that Uprising is now a TV show as well as a radio show? We rely on subscribers to our YouTube channel to fund the TV production of Uprising. And you can sign up to be a subscriber at youtube.com slash uprising with Sonali. We turn back now to Robert Shear, former national affairs correspondent, col uh, columnist for the LA Times, editor-in-chief of truthdig.com, and a professor at the University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. And we're discussing his book, They Know Everything About You, How Data Collecting Corporations and snooping government agencies are destroying democracy. Well, Bob, let's talk about a uh, little bit more about the fact that today information is the product that companies are going after. The fact that um, our every move is being tracked um, is allowing companies to directly market to us in a way that they never dreamed was possible just a few short years ago. And you point out in your book, and we just refer, referred to this before the break, that if we um, prevent companies from putting cookies on our computer or you know, using any of these ways to uh, track us, they literally lose their profit motive. They um, are selling information, every nu nuanced information about us in order to uh, advertise to us. And they will not go back to the days of blind marketing as it, as it is. So how do we then address this issue of the fact that we can never uh, be convinced that or never be sure that this information they're collecting on us won't be shared with the government? Well, uh, uh, vigilance uh, is the price of liberty or the means. I mean, the, the, first of all, we have to have knowledge. If our government feels they want us you know, need to spy on us, since we are supposed to be a representative republic, they should tell us. Okay, it shouldn't depend upon a lone hero like Edward Snowden. And I would raise the question, where are the million other people who had the same classification that it was similar classification and that Edward Snowden? Why aren't they telling they us? They didn't speak is? out. Yeah, no. where are they? Where, you know, Hillary Clinton, who's so upset about, she didn't trust her own State Department to, with her email, but I'm supposed to trust her State Department with my email. Right. That's the kind and, and people don't realize when they hit those agree buttons on all these commercial apps, I mean, you know, we don't realize that when we hit the agree buttons to any company that asks us to log in, that what we're essentially doing is agreeing to let the government have access to this eventually yeah. someday. Okay, so this is the main contradiction, is knowledge. Do we have the right to know? Then we can make a decision. Otherwise, the whole thing, there is no representative governance. 
and do we have so we have the right to know the government has denied us that not only has the government denied it they have threatened with very severe penalties uh, T-Mobile <laughs> Facebook Google uh, uh, if they challenge this and, and you know when Apple and Google move to encryption to do a sort of standard encryption to protect this data the head of the FBI accused them of, of aiding child molesters I mean no, it was the most evil McCarthyite yeah. attack on these leaders of these multinational corporations that you're you're endangering the country so there's no real serious debate about it but let me just make mm -hmm. two points uh, it's not difficult to protect the data okay uh, number one if we had a simple standard of opt-in now I'm talking about the private sector and they, they collect your data and this is something that has been debated uh, Bill Clinton when he was president could have inserted that in the Financial Services Modernization Act people like conservative Bill uh, William Sapphire who was had been Nixon speechwriter who was columnist then for the New York Times Ed Markey who fortunately is now a senator from Massachusetts who's been very good on on privacy was a member of the House, they said if you're going to allow banks, insurance companies, and all that to merge their data, which is, you know, had been prevented by the Glass-Steagall Act of the New Deal, there should be consumer protection. They should have to opt in. Meaning, I want to take your medical records from your insurance company, and I want to give it to this bank when they evaluate your car loan, and I want to give it to your employer. I want to give it to that. Is that okay with you? Right. It's called opt in. Right. Bill Clinton refused to uh, insist on that. He could have said, "I'll." Be veto the bill. No, the banks didn't want it. Why didn't the banks want it? Because they said, if you do that, we don't want to merge. What we're after is the data. Right. The data is the gold here, okay? And we want to more effectively market. Now, you can defend that if it's an informed decision on the part of consumers. Fine. Come after me. Here's all my data. Uh, I'll give you... So that's opt-in. Anybody who tells you that this thing can't be stopped because of the technology, it's a lie. You know, and, and we got some of that malarkey from uh, Eric Schmidt and from Zuckerberg and so forth. They said, hey, get used to it. Don't do anything you're going to be ashamed of. Don't worry about it. Except if you want to know something about the house that Zuckerberg is building on 21st and Dolores <laughs> in San Francisco, oh, no. no, no, because the people who work there, even if they're just sweeping up the yard, they have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Right. And that Privacy for the 1%. <laughs> yes. And he's actually bought all the houses around his neighbors and so nobody wow. can spy on him. So they care a great deal about privacy but when it comes to okay so now we've had pushback from these companies not because they're suddenly good guys but because right. they know that this is really threatening their basic profit model which requires the trust or at least the delusion right. of people around the world that they are being protected okay the so US they were so, so the, these companies were banking on us not knowing that they exactly. were turning the information over to the government exactly and, and that's where Edward Snowden comes in and not just Edward Snowden but other whistleblowers you right. know, and, and, and they let us in. First of all, the Internet was this built by the Defense Department. It was built not to sell us stuff. It was built, presumably, in the event of a nuclear war, we'd have some uh, more robust system to have communications, right. and including communications with the Soviets. Hey, you want to destroy the last city that's still standing, and so forth. That's where it came from. It turned out to be this wicked, uh, you know, the most effective marketing tool in human history, as well as, by the way, a great tool for education enlightenment, uniting people around the world, so forth. I'm very positive on the internet, uh, but it's in danger of being destroyed just because it is right. such an effective marketing tool. What this does, let me, so people don't mm -hmm. get too bummed out, it gives <laughs> us the opportunity now to raise this as an issue. Because, for instance, when you read an excerpt from my book on Salon, where they've run it on Truth There mm -hmm. or any place, at the bottom there will be an ad from Google. Uh, not a Google ad that they've sold to the, uh, from the Google company saying take back the internet fight back and it takes you to a site where you join with Apple and Facebook and Google and they say we have to rein in the NSA I never thought I would live to, to a moment like this these people were in bed with the NSA right they were in bed with the FBI but they're now saying join the three million who've already signed this petition worldwide to prevent these security agencies for so-called security agencies around 
around the world from destroying the internet. That message is coming from the internet companies. Yeah. It's not coming from the telco, you know, not coming from AT&T and Verizon, because they're still saying, hey, let the NSA do what they want. When We haven't been caught with our pants down, which they really have, but, you know, the big fire has come at Google, Apple, so and Facebook. So they want to make it really clear. They want to win back the trust of a consumer base that had initially been just willingly turning over data, assuming it wasn't being shared by the government. Now that we know that it's being shared with the government, it is disrupting the business model of these big companies who want to win back the trust. Now, Worldwide. there's... Uh, yeah, of course, of course. And you're quite knowledgeable about the rest of the world, which t we tend not to be. The ball game is the rest of the world. But in we, Europe, again, when yeah. you wrote about this, in Europe, what's been really interesting is Europeans have won the right to be forgotten by Google. And tell us a, a little bit about this. It was basically a lawsuit? Yeah, it was a, a, a decision of the European Court, which is not, cannot be challenged mm -hmm. now. It's a stance. I am not totally in favor of that decision okay. uh, because I, I, I don't like, as a journalist, okay. I don't like people being able to edit the record as long as rules of libel and you know uh, are applied or slander, mm -hmm. uh, and you can have accountability. I don't think you should ever have the right to print false information or defame people. But I don't like people being able to say, "Hey, you must." Re Move that because I find it uncomfortable. So I thought the decision of the court uh, was a bit ominous, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, but it showed the desperation of people. They say, hey, it was a lawyer in Spain, actually, who brought the lawsuit. And he said, you, you've characterized me this way. It's totally inaccurate, uh, unfair, and I have no power to challenge it. Right. So this, this thing called Google. Uh, and, and you've destroyed my life here. And I'm so he took it to the court. And the court said, yes, you have the right to push back. And you have the right to mm -hmm. demand a change. Mm -hmm. Now that's fine as long as it's you can have a court where you can say this is inaccurate and so forth. I don't like it being that anybody, because what you're going to have is this huge PR industry that the corporations have and they can just clean up their record all the time. Yeah. And we have one great resource uh, on the internet that we need to defend and that's uh, Wikipedia. Yeah. A and uh, Wiki if people can just go and tailor, already I notice on Wikipedia you go to these corporate sites and they have already cleaned it up because they got full-time PR people doing nothing but cleaning Editing up their Wikipedia. Wikipedia yeah. right. and, and so that's a bit ominous. But the principle was a good one, which is that the, the public should have a right to weigh in on these discussions, know how decisions are made, uh, and to, to right. answer, yes. Now, you have a chapter in your book entitled The Military Intelligence Complex, and you point out this very disturbing revolving door between the Pentagon and Google. And tell us about Regina Dugan, who went from being a director at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, known better by its acronym DARPA, and where she left that to work for Google. And there's basically, she's indicative of this kind of breed of techno-utopians who are very excited about the things that technology enables us um, with, it seems, little heed for the implications for people's rights. Yeah, there's a great scene in the book that uh, Sarah Bellotti, who worked with me on the book, and uh, she captured uh, just brilliantly uh, because she was talking about, and you know, I can't use the word because the FCC yes. will, will ban it, <laughs> but, but uh, she gave a very uh, explicit <laughs> Uh, defense of what she does, and she had been head of DARPA in the Defense Department. And yes, it's a perfect, perfect. It's the most perfect example of the revolving door. Google just went in and hired the whole <laughs> DARPA <laughs> crew, beginning with her, brought them over to Google to do their advanced mm -hmm. research. And the intimacy between Google and and DARPA, between Google and the Defense Department, was that so tight. Uh, Sergey Brin and others were on uh, high security clearance. Now the whole thing was we're, we're preventing cyber theft, we're comparing you know, cyber piracy and so forth, and that becomes the, the ruse for saying uh, there's not going to be a paper-thin distance between the Defense Department and these uh, private uh, telecom uh, groups. Uh, and and it's really, it was quite ominous. Again, thanks be to Snowden, uh, <laughs> we, we know now that they can't, you know, that, that it's out there. Uh, but, the, but the sad thing is, these people, she was in the particular scene you're Describing, describing a tattoo on your skin that is totally invasive of everything. Uh, she said that's already been cleared. There's a pill she talked about. Cleared the by tattoo was a microchip embedded yeah, in her skin. But, but
but she actually talked about a pill you take in the morning or something, and, and this becomes a, a, a little computer operating in your body <laughs> using the acids of your body to complete the circuit, and it, and it tells anybody who's surveilling you, uh, well, Google knows if you've taken your pill, but it also knows what your blood pressure, your heartbeat, you know, everything. What and they're activity. really excited about yeah, these sorts yeah, of technologies. Yeah, because it allows them to more. Again, their whole thing, look, the, the bottom line here is, do we define freedom as a freedom to shop? Because if that's right. the main thing, and consumer sovereignty is what this whole experiment and freedom is all about, can I get a green one or a red one? Can, should I get the convertible or not? You know, and this kind of marketing, if that's the exercise of freedom, uh, well, then this helps quite a bit. It also can be quite manipulative, so watch out. Right. Tastes are manufactured, and that's discussed in the book, you know, and Facebook could even manufacture news and, and news flows and uh, manipulate audiences, and that's, of course, what all our modern campaigns are. By the way, Barack Obama pioneered this, really. He was the most effective usage of this kind of data right. uh, in, in becoming president, yeah. and they've been very slick about it. And uh, I know I get messages from, very personal messages uh, from <laughs> Michelle Obama and Barack Obama all the time saying, oh, an hour ago I did this and this. Hi, yeah. Bob, how are you? This right. is Barack, and I'm here to tell you. Well, that's all this kind of targeted yeah. advertising, which this administration has been quite uh, familiar with. Mm -hmm. But but let me say the, yeah. the real danger here is that people have, and I see this with my students, if they're not from countries that have a more obvious totalitarian structure, they just have a benign view of government, but yes. they've also forgotten the main obligation of citizenship in the model of governance that we have, which is an informed public that is capable of acting. What we have is a public that now embraces self-censorship, because if you know you're being monitored all the time, you then do the things that will not bother powerful people. You won't do anything troubling to the people who have power, and you'll just be concerned about your shopping decisions. <laughs> and so that's the most subversive threat to democracy that we have mm -hmm. in, in the modern world. And this is what Orwell, who you began this program talking about, was really warning about, as well as Huxley. Well, we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we will turn to part three of our hour-long conversation with Robert Shear. This is Uprising. Stay with us. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. We turn back now to Robert Shear to discuss his new book, They Know Everything About You, how data collecting corporations and snooping government agencies are destroying democracy. Well, Bob, let's turn to the idea that uh, these tech companies are slowly trying to get us to give up on privacy as a right, treating privacy as a luxury. Uh, you point out how Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg's own position on this seems to have evolved. He started out defending privacy when he first started Facebook. Little by little, he's uh, been open about how thrilled he is that people are just voluntarily giving up information and that people just should get used to this idea. Well, that was their ploy for a while, and that, that's really more, it was effective pre-Snowden. And so that- And it could be effective 
again. Mm -hmm. It could be effective again. If we can demonize Snowden, if we could dismiss his concerns, which you see a tendency in the, not a tendency, it's a campaign in the mass media. I mean, I had people, I spoke at this wonderful All Saints Church in Pasadena. I had people come up and tell me Snowden's a traitor. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, a sort of a popular line of Hillary Clinton, uh, who should have told us all this, but never did. Uh, you know, Diane Feinstein, the senator that I have voted for at times in my life, you know, she knew all this. And she's never the, the biggest it. defender of yeah, the NSA. Yeah, they just forget it. And, and so is Barack Obama. After all, here is the president who knows these issues certainly better than I do. He's a constitutional law professor. He knows the significance of, of individual sovereignty, of what the Fourth Amendment is all about. You know, uh, and why hasn't he used this as presidency as a bully pulpit to educate this country about why? Why we have the Bill of Rights, why we have a Constitution, why we have limited government. So and he's uh, not just defended the NSA; he's perpetrated. He's taken George W. Bush's legacy and uh, furthered it. Exactly. Yeah. He's uh, gone after more whistleblowers than all, all the, not just George W. Bush, all previous presidents combined. He's used the Espionage Act more than all of them. So he's actually been our most dangerous uh, president in terms of destroying uh, this protection. You know, more than Nixon. More than, yes. So I'm not trying to uh, give him a buy. I'm just saying uh, the the problem is uh, that our political leadership, bipartisan, uh, has failed us totally. And you could argue Rand Paul has been uh, better on these issues by far than Hillary Clinton. I'm sorry to disturb people listening to this, uh, but the, I, I, when it comes to this privacy issue, no question. Well, about libertarians it. tend to agree yeah. on the importance of privacy, even principled, if we disagree on other things. Principled, consistent libertarians. Not all libertarians right. are principled, but then again, not all liberals and not all lefties. And, and okay, but if you are a principled libertarian, you have to be against crony capitalism, and you have to be against this extension of the power. Of, of, the, of the federal government and, and uh, of course, yeah. the main excuse for extending the power of the federal government and for crony capitalism is national security. That has always been the case. Let me just say categorically to anyone listening to the show who buys any of these arguments uh, that there is not one documented case where gathering this haystack of information on the American people to get those few bad needles in the haystack has worked. The President of the United States, Barack Obama, when Press to find an example came up with the fellow in San Diego, Mindo, the 19th uh, hijacker. That turned out to be a phony. He was living at the house of an FBI informant. He was well known to the CIA and the FBI. The two agencies didn't talk to each other. Uh, there was no question about finding out the, who was he talking to in Yemen. Uh, AT&T would turn that number over to, to the FBI in two minutes. So it was a lie. They have not been able to find any examples where this stuff worked. In fact, the, the gathering of this haystack of information on everybody in the world has been an enormous distraction. Uh, the people who did the Charlie Hebdo uh, massacre in France, the people who did the Boston Marathon attack, they were well known to the police. The person in Paris, one of them had already been served time. Yeah. All you needed was for some cop to go some out and say, police work. yeah, <laughs> we're not good police, traditional. <laughs> hey, what are they doing now? What are they up to now? You know, and, and find out who they are. You didn't have to gather information on everybody in the world to answer that question, and that was true of the Boston Marathon. These are two people upset about what was happening in, in Chechnya, you know, and, and they had a record. They were traveling, well-known. But go back to the original 9-11. Who are the 15 Saudi hijackers? We still don't know. You've got this great intelligence apparatus, you know. You've got this great ability to sift through. I ask a very simple question. This attack that provoked the whole thing, that caused the Patriot Act, that did all this madness. By the way, the Patriot Act that's up for renewal. Yeah. Yeah. In, in June, and everybody should be following what's happening to that. Is it going to be renewed? Is it going to be challenged? Is it going to be changed? That's the key thing, by the way, that the Google, Apple, Facebook website brings information on. They're trying to get reform of the Patriot Act, so people should at least be with Google on this. On that issue, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and Apple, uh, and, and, and uh, find out if your Congress person is at least taking as progressive a position as Google, Facebook, and Apple, right? That, that, that's the issue here, or are they saying nothing uh, about this, you know? And this goes for Democratic as well as Republican uh, uh, Congress people. But to answer your question, I don't want to avoid it, uh, the Zuckerberg question. Yeah. They have been forced to change their position. When they said get over it, privacy is over, and so forth, they r now realize the error of their ways uh, because it destroys their marketing model in the world. The people of the world 
care about privacy. And they know that the great contribution of the U.S. was a notion of individual sovereignty. If there's any respect at all for our, the framers of our Constitution, of our model, anywhere in the world, and I have traveled very extensively. I don't care whether you're talking about in Havana, Moscow, you know, you're talking about Beijing. I've been to all these places. I've been there under sometimes totalitarian governments and uh, claiming to be otherwise or what. I've been in Egypt. I've been all these places as a journalist. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you the one enduring legacy of the American experience was the idea of limited government and that idea of the individual sovereignty of, of, of you know that was basic to it is what has been destroyed in this post 9/11 Period. Right, not limited government when it comes to health care, but limited government when it comes to surveillance. Yes, no, limited <laughs> because government. Because that's what the right does, right? Yes. That, that's their idea of limited government is to limit the ability of the government to actually provide Let social me just safety nets. that but one, yeah. by the way. If, in fact, we could truly get limited government and have the states deliver health care, which after all was detention, and go with the Vermont model that was threatening at one point to do single payer, if we in California could actually have a robust single payer plan, you know, but they have used the federal government, this is a little bit off the top, yeah. <laughs> but, but it relates in a way, there, it, it, and this is where I say you have to be a principal libertarian for me to take you seriously, because otherwise you're really talking about taking power away from people, and so-called free market, which these big corporations can manipulate at will. But if we actually could have, go back to this framers idea, and on the state level, particularly in those states where we have some populist, and Energy and say, no, you know, we here in California, we'll go with our own health care system, let Vermont have its own health care system, and so forth. I think that is a good way to go, you know, yeah. because we can't control the federal government. Lobbyists control the federal government. Money controls the federal government. Mm -hmm. I can tell you. I'll so single-payer statewide health I'll just give you one good example that ties these two issues together. Bonnie Frank. When I was doing my research on the uh, doing away with the Glass-Steagall Act, Bonnie Frank was the key person, and he actually gets to it a little bit obliquely in his current book, you know, but if Bonnie Frank, and, and they, they went, uh, you know, uh, if they had really challenged Clinton, we could have saved Glass-Steagall, <laughs> but we didn't. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, here is Bonnie Frank on, on that issue, but on this question of privacy, could have said, no, we want to protect the rights of the individual. You know, instead, they caved to the lobbying for the big industries, particularly in their case, the banks, in the case of surveillance, the telecoms, and, and so forth. Right, yeah. Well, Bob, the sad part about where we are today is that we have sort of been here before. I mean, essentially, and you point this out in your book, today the buzzword is terrorism, and way back when it was communism. And if they had the technology back then, they would have applied the same sorts of. Uh, uh, That's the big if. Right. We have <laughs> not been there before. We are actually in a world that... We've been that, spied on before, but never to this extent. No, no. This is what we really have to be clear about, mm -hmm. you know. I, 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 this is something a Huxley and a George Orwell never could have imagined. Yeah. Uh, this reach of this modern... Unprecedented. As, um, uh, look, I could tell you, just as somebody who operates, you know, I'm an editor, of, as you know, yeah. of an Internet site. We don't do this. But just what you can learn about who's coming and where they're coming from, how long they stay, what they read. Uh, and then if you look at what Google can learn, you know, uh, did anybody just think, anybody listening to this just think, how did that ad mysteriously pop up next to the sure. article you're reading? Consider, you are being spied on 24-7. You don't want to use the word spying, you are being observed 24-7. Even if you're in your pajamas, even if you're in your bed, okay? And the technology, by the way, extends far beyond your laptop. It's the thermostat on your stove. It's the alarm system system in your house. This this technology now goes quite extensively. It's that little gadget you attach to your baggage. It's that watch. And they're cross-referencing all this data all to paint a picture of every individual. Yes, all the time. And what people should understand about the modern technology, in the old, I got my FBI file. I know what was done to Martin Luther King. I understand the old days. To get Martin Luther King, you know, they, the FBI, everybody should remember, you're talking about a benign view of government. It was 
our FBI under J. Edgar Hoover went out to destroy the most important human rights leader this country has ever produced, okay, Martin Luther King, went out to destroy him, to drive him to suicide. And it wasn't just J. Edgar Hoover, it was all the top people in the FBI. William Sullivan, you know, was Deke DeLoach, all of those people were in on it, okay? And they went out to, to get this guy to commit suicide. That's what that whole plot was about. Yet, how could they get information on King? You would have to physically follow him. Well, the old fashioned. People in the old fashioned way knew they were probably being followed. Yeah. You'd have to get the room next to his in the hotel. You'd have to cut into his phone line and so forth. None of that is needed now. None of that. They, we, if there was a Martin Luther King, and there are Martin Luther Kings, I don't know what happened to Elliot Spitzer. Elliot Spitzer was mm -hmm. one of the most promising politicians, governor of New York. He'd gone after the bank. He was a really major progressive figure. He gets destroyed, right, because of, you know, a prostitution scandal. Uh, you know, what happened to Scott Ritter, the most effective critic we had mm -hmm. a, a, of, of the war in Iraq, most knowledgeable, serving time because of a, a, an entrapment online, you know? And most of us look the other the way out. We don't want to touch it. The fact of the matter, it's happening now, and we don't know all the people being blackmailed, all the people being intimidated. So if you think of what the, they can do now, and the they, I mean, people of power in government, uh, what they can do, they would have destroyed Martin Luther King. You, he would have been finished, oh, right? right? Yeah. And so uh, the technology does matter. And it's not just today's technology. You have to believe, uh, no, this is being expanded at an exponential rate uh, of what can be found out about you. So yes, you're going to buy the new watch. And, and what is that watch going to tell him? What is that recording? You know, and, and you So we have a, mi a minute and a half left. Let's, yeah. uh, let's end on the kinds of things that people can do. You mentioned some of the things that Google is trying to do to uh, reform the Patriot Act. But lest we feel that, uh, uh, all right, I'm just going to uh, unplug from the world, which is almost impossible to do today. What's the silver lining, Bob? The silver lining is there's a contradiction in multinational capitalism. And this thing, the America's greatest export is this information technology manipulation. And what the NSA has done, and thanks to Edward Snowden, we know what they've done and what the CIA is doing and the FBI, they're destroying the basic profitable, the most profitable business model America has. Because no one in the world is going to rely on American technology if, in fact, as we've learned, the NSA and the CIA are implanting code on the hardware, okay, uh, trafficking there, they are destroying the most profitable business activity America has going at this time. Google, Apple, Facebook, they know it. And that's why they are leading the charge to, to get rid of these uh, 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 onerous provisions of the Patriot Act. Uh, so it's not just Bob Shear, it's not just Pacific, it's not just, you know, uh, uh, anybody else. It's these main corporations, and they're only doing it because of Edward Snowden and people uh, like that uh, who have revealed the truth. But the fact is that cat is out of the bag. And they're uh, doing it because we're expressing we want our privacy. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. And so people need to be really clear about that to them. Well, Bob Shear, we could go on for many hours, but uh, people can pick up a copy of your book, and uh, and I hope they do, and I want to wish you the best of luck, uh, and also that our Southern California audience know that Bob Shear is going to be speaking at the Topanga Community House on Friday, April 3rd at 1440 Topanga Canyon Boulevard, and we'll post details at uprisingwithsonali.com uh, about that. Thank you so much, Bob. Best of luck to you. Thank you. My guest, Robert Shear, is a former National Affairs Correspondent and col columnist for the LA Times, Editor-in-Chief of Truthstick.com, and a professor at the University of Southern California's, Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. And his book is called They Know Everything About You, How Data Collecting Corporations and Snooping Government Agencies Are Destroying Democracy. This is Uprising. Sitting in for senior producer Bipasha Shom is Anna Bus. Christian Beck is our production coordinator. Joseph Stone is our technical director. And Corinne Gaston is our intern. Federico Garcia is our audio engineer. Annie Mendoza is our social media coordinator. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash uprising with sonali our website is uprising with sonali.com our theme music is by quetzal i'm sonali kohatkar host and executive producer of uprising thanks so much and i'll see you tomorrow